Greetings to you, wherever you may be in the world today. Alan Clements here in the second session on day three of our global virtual gathering. Uh, I want to say this is the final session, but it's truly just another set of moments in this, this experience of living together. Um, Thank you for being part of this journey, this space, being in my life, being in our lives together. Mm. Many people have asked me over the last several months, what do I want? What do I intend to do? What do I intend to be? And I've thought a lot about what I want to do, where I want to be, who I want to be with. And they're, they're, they're mostly <clears throat> qualities, qualities more so than locations. With the ongoing <clears throat> I don't even know how to describe the pandemic with with COVID, with vaccinations, with quarantines. I don't know how, I want to say people, but I don't know how the children will manage to decipher or discern truthful information from propaganda to safeguard their own heart and mind from the digital and the traditional media forms of manipulating, which Noam Chomsky has so articulately discussed over the decades, mind control, mind control in uh, democratic societies, not just under dictatorship or authoritarian rule. You know, beyond the poetry of our Dharma, Today there's an added vigilance to learn the fine, courageous art to safeguard. I use the word safeguard here very deliberately, how to safeguard. I want to say your own independent thinking, but frankly your own sanity. How to safeguard your sanity. What is sanity? a respect for self, a respect for civil discourse, the the beauty of our dialogues that are open-ended, fearlessly brought forth without persecution, without desecration, without the fear of incarceration, alienation, vilification. Cancellation culture is a very mild way of talking about censorship. And it's just a, it's a running dog for totalitarianism. May 1933, the brown shirts burned 25,000 different books in the city square in Berlin. Many great philosophers, thinkers were among those book burnings. Now, now there's no longer book burnings. The books still exist, although you burn a copy. But digital cancellation today is a permanent erasure of of thought, of freedom of thought. So we talk about our Dharma today, my spirituality is very inseparable from 
the the necessity, I would say, the deep responsibility, if not the obligation, of the citizen of a democracy, of a global world, to not only safeguard one's own sanity, one's own independent thinking, one's own universal respect for human rights, environmental rights, but to not only champion the rights of others, but to really diligently participate in the essential activism of protecting and supporting the rights of others. Uh, it's stating the obvious, but we're, we're under assault on every front. And if not careful, it's very easy to be conscripted into the paradigms of conflict, even among families today. Have you been vaccinated? Will you get vaccinated? Why aren't you vaccinated? Those are mild versions of dictatorship. Generally speaking, when I put things in my body, it's voluntarily. It's out of choice. I love America because of our choice here on Independence Day. And uh, choice is being radically manipulated to be carelessness of other, recklessness. And we must be very careful of coercion, our participation in mind control, being conscripted into the paradigm of limiting human and environmental and animal freedoms. So, can't speak enough about the word freedom and just want to stress here in this opening few minutes of this ongoing final session of this three-day global virtual gathering, my way of thanking you for participating in this process. I wish there was a chance digitally to communicate more intimately with dialogue and questions. I'm a little bit behind the curve with regard to Zoom. It's been recommended to get off of Facebook Live and to go on to Facebook Dead <laughs> and get involved with people, although it be a two-dimensional image, at least there's communication. And so my way of saying that God willing, I hope to evolve from this medium into something where I can communicate. I'm enjoying the human contact here. We're going to open it up in a minute to the concerns of the people who've taken time from their day, from their lives, who've come to Maui, and who are participating here in this nature reserve, in this very temporary uh, temple. And to enjoy the greatest freedom that we know, I think, here in America. The freedom to, to speak and communicate our innermost thoughts without fear of persecution or denigration, vilification. The protection, the elevation of freedom of speech. And uh, my way of saying to you, although we're not connecting here in real flesh time, auditory vibration, shared space time, um, may I encourage you to encourage me to encourage our family and friends here in America, we are doing what we can to not celebrate Independence Day alone without the incredible apology to the desecration of indigenous people, to the long history planetarily and also here in America of desecration, slavery, apartheid, torture. But to see this acknowledgement of independence and freedom to be metaphorically an expression, an invitation to take it higher, evolve freedom, liberate freedom, keep alive the radiance of a liberating speech, not just that we speak freely, but that we keep liberating free speech, excuse me, by understanding the emotion of freedom within speech, authenticity within the words, integrity within the words. We liberate speech by understanding the emotions, the spiritual energy, the psychological wisdom, the emotional wisdom, the Dhamma intelligence inherent in the human heart, if we so bring that intelligence into speech, speech that speaks from that intention to elevate the status of others and nature and protect nature, protect the animals, call off this incessant factory farming, 
this blind normalization of the mass murder of the animal, the mass murder of non-humans, the genocide of non-humans, the ongoing unthinkable evil vilification of the non-human. Here on Independence Day, we talk about human life as priority over life. So I just want to remind myself to be reminded by you, to remind you, to remind yourself and your friends that we're not alone in this world, right? And there's so much priority given to the salvation of the individual in the terms of her and his own need to salvate and to evolve their own personal drama dhamma. But contextual dharma means high, high, unthinkable respect for nature and non-human. So on Independence Day, July 4th here in America, I know many of you aren't in America, but it's a global celebration of the elevation and the liberation of the 30 articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and include the animal rights, the tree rights, the ocean rights. If oceans and animals had a right to vote, who would they vote for? We don't include very easily the heartbeat of the planet. Part of the dilemma of the human species is it's very myopic, self-centered, pride-driven, narcissistically rooted in selfdom. And it's very challenging to overcome that centrifugal naturalness of self over other to the point we become very frightened enough to dominate and violate life around us. And so here on Independence Day, I want to give a little bit of a rave for that placement of the human in context to nature, non-humans, the animals, the insects, the birds, the fish, all the photonic vibrations going on right now within the seven mile high atmospheric, stratospheric moment where we get to see each other and see the trees, to see the birds, to see and feel the wind and the air. We belong to this deep, inseparable eco-psychological, spiritual, existential ecosystem, these deep intelligences. May I invite you to empower the concept Dhamma intelligence. The radical integration of all forms of intelligence with high respect, the dignifying of our presence in context, walking softly, elevating highly, creating a reverence on the special planet in our particular dimension of this universe. I'm a savage radical. I don't like what I see in the world. I've grown accustomed to that type of rebellion in me as to be not only natural, but to be encouraged. I don't want to be one with this world. I want to be at two with it. I want to be at two with violence. I don't want to internalize the violence that when I become peaceful, all violence disappears and therefore I'm free and happy. To me, it's a bad design that we murder and glorify murder. That's an aberrant state of consciousness to me. I don't want to see it as my problem alone. It's baked into the DNA to state the obvious. And so there's something in this journey right now on Independence Day, and we're going to open it up here in a second to dialogue and questions. What really matters? You know, the question, what really, really, really matters here at the precipice of time and change and apocalypses and extinctions in between the fifth and the sixth, and they say there'll be another ten in the discernible future, all within the context of a solar system, within galaxies, within dimensions, within the quantum field of waves and particles. Here we sit and abide and live and die. What really matters? Can we ask our heart that question more deeply? 
I've been blessed and terrified by having refugees who I don't even know their name give me their last morsel of food when there is no other food to eat. I've had strangers protect me from gunshots and bombs. I've been held by strangers in times of trauma and struggle. Strangers become family. I've lived in cities under siege. During the war in Yugoslavia, I was blessed and cursed to be there as a non-combatant, one far away from the front lines, but very intimately connected to displaced people, two, three hundred thousand people living on the city streets of Zagreb. Billionaires, millionaires, those who drove Lamborghinis and Mercedes. People like you and me, blue-eyed, green-eyed, people who studied meditation, tantra, psychotherapists, living on the street with nothing. In our hallway, families with children, with very little. We're in this together is my point. Freedom is a collective experience. Are we participating in that collective? Dedicating our lives to the activism of freedom beyond religion, beyond politics. We're being forced into frontline activism based upon the unbelievable, unbridled tenacity of a dictator all over the world. In our own hearts, if we're not aware of being conscripted into the totalitarian psychology of belonging like slaves to the master, we must stand vigilantly together in solidarity and confront totalitarianism. It's not enough to practice our own religion anymore. It's the religion of freedom. So may I encourage you to study the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the most abused and violated three pages on the planet, the basis of civilized existence, the framework, the architecture of democracy, the guiding principles of our founding sisters and mothers and fathers, the universality of Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 with Eleanor Roosevelt, freedom of speech, of thought and conscience, the best safeguards against violence, war and genocide, keeping freedom alive, the freedom of self and the freedom of other. Freedom comes with responsibility. My freedom alone is not enough. My freedom is inseparable from yours. When I'm free, you're free. No. I must look at you honestly and look at your life and to see what I can do to elevate the status of your freedom. That's not activism. That's human love. So may we encourage ourselves to untangle from explicit normalized forms of violence. If I want my daughter to grow in a world, I want to see her grow up in a world without violence. Let me ask you as I stop here, write down the ways in which you unknowingly or knowingly compromise your love of unity, harmony and peace and nonviolence. Look at the ways in which you normalize violence, what you put into your mouth, your body, how you walk and talk, what you wear how you listen, what you buy, what you refrain from, where you drive, where you fly. What is your impact? A few years back, I was in Burma. I went to the most impoverished area of the city, Yangon. 300,000 people living in unthinkable abject squalor. You had to put your hand on your nose to survive the stench of human feces and urine everywhere. Children with black, deep holes, caves in their eyes, red hair, extended bellies, hundreds of thousands of people, 20, 30, 50 children followed behind me and my translator. Many of them don't even know when they were born, never read a book, will never go to school. Who are their parents? If they're lucky, they drive at that time pre-COVID into the city on a bus to work 10, 12, 14 hours to build a three, four, five-star hotel, a condominium for the fat cats around the world, even for me. And they go back on that bus to go back to their children to eat barely anything at all. These are called ghost slaves for my lifestyle. It's said that it takes at least 60 to 70 to 80 people that we'll never meet in life to sustain the privilege of a Western existence. Set aside what we unknowingly ingest and drink in the name of normal. But just think of the role of all those people on what I wear, how I fly, what I live in, 
what I use, the plastics, the cars, everything in the world by these ghost slaves, as it's been called. People we never know to sustain the privilege of our lives. On Independence Day, the celebration of freedom. I read it yesterday, and I still think I have it somewhere, although I can't find it at the moment. And I'll end with this, I promise. Frederick Douglass, the great speech he gave on July 5th, 1852. It's titled, The Meaning of the July 4th for the Negro. For the Negro, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? What does it mean to us? His answer, This day reveals to him and her more than all other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he and she is the constant victim. In honor of the essence of our existence, in our freedom, in our independence. May I encourage us and encourage you to encourage me to take a moment here, even just for 30 seconds, to know that where we sit and how we live, we're historical, our roots, our family, our relatives are in the millions and billions And we are alive today often at the expense of other people's massacres, genocides, unthinkable forms of ethnic and racial and religious cleansing, the mass violence of the human species upon itself and upon nature and animals. This is not a downer story. If we're going to celebrate Independence Day and freedom, It's accountability, it's truth-telling, it's reconciliation. And may I encourage us to examine the way in which we unknowingly normalize our lives at the desecration and the murder of non-humans and nature and other lives. On this day, may we evolve a freedom that equally empowers compassion, accountability, self-honesty, and historical honesty to overcome the flaws and the mistakes of the human psyche to elevate a freedom that is best in our human lives is free of violence, known or unknown. To me, that would be my most sacred prayer for the future of life. Do all that we possibly can within all cultures to overcome control, manipulation, coercion, whether it be through profit and privilege or the cruelty of violence, torture, genocide, and war. Let freedom, you know, reign supreme, a freedom that includes all life, not just human life, not just our privileged life, not just our particular ethnicity, not our particularly economic considerations. So... From my heart to yours, thank you for tuning in. Questions that may be important to you, I wish I could communicate with you, but we're going to turn it over now to the people who have taken time in their life to come to this group for this final session today. So thank you for tuning in. I hope you hang in. And if there are questions or issues or concerns, Karen has a list of one by one. Can we hear them? The number one question by more than one person is, how do we call in our partner? How do we call in our partners? Yo, yo, Tinder man here. I'm going to go down with that one. How do we call in our partners? Second question, how do we call in the right partner? Third question, how do I get rid of the partner I called in? (laughs) How can I pay for getting rid of the partner I called in? I want to meet my real partner now. How not to make a mistake in partnerdom. But how do you call in your real partner? That's a very interesting, very, very compelling question. Let me see if I can just dive into that. Um, I 
Well, do Facebook Live and tell the world I want to be in love with someone who's really my right partner. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you, anyone out there who sees yourself, heterosexual Alan Clements, as a vital possible member of my human heart, with all the various attributes of openness, vulnerability, romance, eroticism, sapiosexual skills. You don't have to even meditate for God's sake, but you must love low dosing. <laughs> you know, whatever you want to do, you want to have multiple partners, that's your choice. I am completely monogamous and I love the purity of that particular expression, but don't lie to me because if you do, you're not the right partner. However, Let's experiment, let's be open, let's be unconventional. State the truth of who you are in your bio, wherever you might do it. Tell your friends that you're looking to be in love in a way that's uniquely true to the edge of who you are now in this context. Oh, that's the easy thing to say. <laughs> the hardest thing to say is be the lover of your own life and make love and dance and celebrate in your autonomy because often one becomes compromised in relationship. And you want two people who want to become whole together? Is that the cliche? How do you do it? How do you do it? Um, my experience has been that just as suddenly as you want it and give it up, out of the unknown, something shows up. Someone comes into your life. You just got to be very, very careful in believing in chemistry because you can go down a rabbit hole there that really ends in a bad way and call it the serendipity of choice and magic and learning. But to me, going slow with someone who is essentially a friend there's something so beautiful about that type of rapport. If you kind of relax the notion of needing to be sexual within the first few months, I couldn't recommend it. I've been doing it for decades, telling younger people especially, but also middle-aged and even older people, to chill on the chemistry sexual level and just hang. Even if you're really attracted to each other, just chill. My former partner and I, we knew each other for three years. And for the first three months, we decidedly hung out without being overtly sexual. We'd hang out naked, we'd talk, but the whole process was about leaning back rather than forward. Just hang and become more comfortable in what I call, which is not so cliched, the sapiosexual forms of intimacy. Learn to make love with consciousness and learn a trust and a relaxation that takes the harder, faster movement out of the habit. And all those breathtaking expressions of eroticism and romance, as groovy as they are, at this stage you want someone you can really love talking to, right? You want to be able to know that you love overhearing how they respect themselves. You learn from them, you listen to them. You don't have to be overly, you know, just taken by passion. These are old forms of intimacy, I think. Yes, it's groovy to do that, but there's ways to be awakened in passions that are deeper than chemistry. You've got to really like someone. I think that takes time. And really liking someone where friendship is the basis, then no matter what happens, even, oh, you want to be with someone else and you're falling in love? How beautiful. This is where namaste really has meaning. I honor the God in you. May you be so happy with that woman or that man. Or if you're polyamorous and you need to do that, fine. But just I'm not part of that paradigm. But I'm so happy for you. Because you know nothing's being lost. Nothing's lost. You're friends. You're allies. You're even developing a more intimate relationship in the new form. That's not an ideal. It just means going slowly, I feel, in knowing that my love of you is based upon friendship liking someone? Can you articulate the like? And if there is attraction, I just believe in going really, really slow, old-fashioned slow. Dating, gifting, loving, hanging out, learn what it means to hold hands, to be respectful, to be kind, to be generous. And yeah, oh God, I can't wait! You know, great, okay, do it. But that's not how I go about it. 
Friendship is also very beautiful. It doesn't have to be romantic or erotic or sexual. There's something very beautiful about having people in your life, men and women both, where you're just really down and you really specialize in the communication of the soul. Um, Chemistry is very easy to mask the more intimate expressions of human contact. So, you know, some of those things, how do you meet them? Tell all of your friends in the world, I'm open, I'm really at that place in life that I want to meet new people. This doesn't have to be romantic or sexual. I want to meet new people. Do you know anyone in your life who may want to meet a new man, a new woman? I'm. Say again. That works for you. It hasn't worked for me, so I'm just wondering if that works for all my friends now that I would love to meet some more people. Karen is declaring her independence and her desire to meet someone. I think that's beautiful and magnificent. Anyone who loves you would do all that they possibly can to keep that awareness in their life. I mean, I'm always looking around at suitable people that I might want to match up, even just as friends or... I mean, there's nothing more beautiful than sharing something really beautiful, like a cookie, you want to share it with someone. A movie, you want to share it with someone, right? A book, you want to share it with someone. A friend, you want to share it with her, with him. In a lot of people, it's not out of loneliness. We want to connect. We want a sangha. We want to be brothers and sisters. In that rare configuration, those of you who have sustained in a relationship, how beautiful. Um, <clears throat> Striking up unusual conversations in unusual moments. I'm a real believer in the serendipity of the public life. There's no one who I won't talk to. I mean, really. I just love over the counter. And there's something in that magic that keeps you in the spirit of intimacy. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. If you just keep waiting, I don't do digital dating. It's just not, I don't want that. Hi, and it's beautiful. I mean, this is digital dating, but nothing comes of it except a lot of blowback. But however, just talk to people, meet people. But it's, you know, I can't even say much more than that. And if you're so lucky, may it actually be a reward to you. Be public, be willing to expose yourself, reveal yourself. I got involved based upon Uparle, the gentleman who was imprisoned in theater. And actors and producers and directors told me there's no way you can succeed in that. You have to memorize your monologue. You've got to write it. You need to have producers and directors help you. I said, no, I don't have time for that. I want to do what I want to do, which is to be improvisationally present with an audience and celebrate the freedom of speech rather than having people applaud me based upon my memory. Well, 287 shows later, 22 years later, still going. And it doesn't matter where you are. Are you really revealing yourself? There's a lot of satisfaction that comes from expression. A lot of untapped needs can be understood by are you really in expression of your life? And I think a lot of it can be said by are you getting up in the morning and feeling the fullness of your posture, How well do you dress? Do you look beautiful in the mirror of your own heart? Are you going to go about the business of your art and your dharma? Are you sitting? Are you walking? Are you doing all that you possibly can to stay emotionally and physically and existentially fit, dynamic? Are you attractive? Very few women, I've said this to women, do you know what's attractive about you? They'll go, no. And, and it's, I did it in Bali for about six months. And I didn't do it deliberately. It was sort of deliberately. <laughs> and most women did not know what was attractive about them. It was amazing to me. And they, in most cases, and I can only say it was what it was attractive to me, but I have a good range of thinking what's attractive, It was often not what they would think about in themselves. And just in that reflection, there was often an empowerment that happened that expanded their capacity to feel more radiant. And I do believe that when there's a kind of radiance about who you are, you become attractive. There's a kind of energetic 
Right? Am I a little bit too Maui-like here? No. There's a little. There's something that magnetizes that level of radiance. And even if it's not a lover, it's like, wow, I'm satisfying something of the intimacy space. I think that's so much of what I've been missing in the last year and a half with the pandemic is human interaction. I love group interaction and I quite love theatrical interaction. And uh, am I lonely? Would I like to have a partner? I mean, those are very strange concepts on a certain level. I don't know anymore. But I really know that I really like being with someone who really likes to get down. I mean, really likes to get down. And I mean radical, improvisational, satirical comedy where you can say anything you possibly want that undresses the conformity of those fucking assholes who you want to fucking denigrate. I mean, you can... Because you're not being mean. You're just... Do you get that? Do you get... And they, they're getting it. And that's where... Look at Ricky Gervais. He said, all of my material comes from my marriage. Every great comedian has a great wife or a great husband. And I really miss that level of day-to-day dialogue with the get-down. And that's what really is exciting. So you can't work. You have to be independently wealthy. (laughs) You've got to have a strong comedic background. You have to love dark satire, not mild satire. I mean, really super X-rated satire. Anyone read this book? Two? You haven't read it? It's so good. (laughs) Extinction X-rated. This is uncensored, spiritually incorrect times 100. Everything I would never say publicly, I said in writing. (laughs) And it was my attempt to... Like, it was my message out of the bottle. If there's ever a person out in the world who wants to be with me, you've got to basically read this. (laughs) This was, this, this was my Tinder. This was my dating app. Because this is the most authentic, real element of me. But it's only a dimension. But it's my attempt to use words and language and energy to challenge violence in the collective intelligence on the planet. That's all it was. If I'm going to go down with the ship, listen, people use guns, I use words. And if you're offended by that, fuck you. You know what can you say? But I'll tell you, I I unleashed, and I think a lot of partnering comes when all of a sudden you're on the same stage together and you're going like, God, I really like you. And the more I'm authentic, the more I meet people that I like and like me. And you know that you're meeting in a very unique way. And just take your time over time. I'm, I talked to four or five different men and four or five different women on a moderately frequent basis. Not once have I indicated in those years of connection with these women specifically any possibility of a romantic connection or a sexual connection or even an attraction. I just want to trust that what we're doing is pure, evolutional, beautiful, and I want to go so slow that you and I are friends. That's it. I want to know, because the last time I thought we were friends, we're not talking for some strange reason. And that was very disruptive to me, that you could know someone so well, but the evolution of it was, hey, listen, you want to be with that guy? Full support. But where did that friendship go? And that's weird to me. I don't... The women I've been with, the ones that are really beautiful in soul, we're tighter now than before. And I think if you can't do that, you know, what the fuck are you doing, you know? I don't want stop and starts anymore like that. So slowness is my need because I'm the worst possible relationship teacher, guide, therapist. Do not under any circumstance trust me with information (laughs) about partnering. (laughs) I've had some terrible black holes and I'm sure I've been worse for some of the women I've been with. So, question two. No, that was the question. And no other questions? Okay, other questions you might have that might be important to you. Things, take your time. We've got about an hour and ten minutes and forever hold our peace. At least with me here. 
And I don't know what my future holds, you know, none of us do, but I don't really know. I don't know how long I'll be here. I don't know where I'm going. It's a quality somewhere inside that I'm looking for. People ask, where are you going to go? How long are you going to be on Maui? That kind of thing. And I, 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 I truly rarely use the word, but I'm yearning for the sanctity of a context that I remember in different times in my life. I was a monk, as you know, some of you know, but one particular time back in 1980, I was on a five-acre island in a deep inlet in southern Sri Lanka. It's a very rarely known place. It's called Pogastua. It was started by the earliest Westerners in Asian Dharma, uh, boys and girls that left primarily Germany in the 1800s. And one particular man became a monk and he started this monastery on this five-acre island in this big lagoon off the southern tip of Sri Lanka called the Island Hermitage. A lot of the great books that we read in English, the Sudhi Maga, things like that, have been translated by monks who once lived there. It's the biggest, most prestigious library in Asia in English language. And I went there to study and to be in silence. You can't talk. You must stay alone. And there's no running water. There's no electricity. Food is brought in daily by the lay people in rowboats. And there you hang in your little cottage with your own little water well. Uh, and you create little places where you urinate and enter the call of nature. And you bathe in the well. You wash your own robes. And you commune in this ancient virginal forest with radical life. Those of you who've been to Sri Lanka know that it's it's prehistoric when you get away from the urban settings. We had an island that was filled with these Komodo dragon-like creatures called cobras. They're between 60 and 150 pound lizards. And there are pods of them, 20, 30, 40 at a time, and they're, they're in the water and then they're back on land. And they think that they own the land and you're kind of just walking around them. You've got to be very careful. If you walk too close to them and they swing their tail, it'll break your leg. They climb trees. They shake branches to take birds that fall. They're carnivorous. They eat each other. You embed in nature and you begin to see. I did, for the first time in my life, see the utter brutality in my, of nature. You're just in the food chain. You couldn't stop because of the, you had to, if you ever stopped, you had to do this because of the mosquitoes, the dengue, the malaria. You had to constantly dance like you were kind of a hip hop artist to keep them off your body like that. How many times we'd wake up with rat bites and rats biting our legs and our arms? It's nature. How many times you'd see radical poisonous snakes just, you know, you got to be very careful. There's the long viper, there's the short viper, three or four inches that are lethal that can kill within two minutes. Dogs would be brought out sometimes unknowingly. They'd end up dead, just bloated within a minute of a viper bite in it. And, you know, you live in this context Why I'm bringing it up. It's not the nature issue, but the psychic silence. When you don't talk like that and you're meditating a lot and you're in the place where you know you want to be, you ever be there, where you know you are who you are, where you want to be. I, I don't I don't feel that here. It's, I want to be where I want to be and I want to feel that I really want to be there and belong there and a little bit of longevity with that belonging. I'm telling myself, where can I be for the next eight months? I think of Sri Lanka, the island hermitage, the sanctity of that, the psychic silence, the communion. I want to increase my meditation from 30 minutes to an hour to three, four, five hours. I want to write. I want to broadcast. I want to commune with the woman, the man. I want to talk. I want to relate. I want to low dose, medium dose. I want to fast. 
I want to visualize my aorta, my aneurysm. I want it to contract. I want it to go back to normal. I can do that. I'm telling myself that. Stay positive. Stay positive. And But I, I feel like I need safety. I want food brought in if I can. Please, please, please. Small financial support. Please, please, please. But it's that Sri Lankan acreage that I'm looking for. Somewhere where I can call off travel, communication, turn off the phone, and just commune with my heart and the few people there. I did it in Bali. I'm thinking of Bali, but Bali has become immeasurably complicated in the last three days. Quarantines and Mac, you know, vaccinations that are mandatory and so many obstacles now. And it's like, oh my God, it's closing in, but don't get claustrophobic. So partnering, and it's all to me right now about creating a, 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 a sanctuary in my soul where I can hear myself at the deepest levels. And my mantra, and I'll turn it over to you, is if I live long enough, which I think I will, I don't know, have no clue, none of us do, to get a second CT scan of this aneurysm eight months out from now, a year from when it was diagnosed, only then can they measure in millimeters, has it grown? And if it has, it means that you're on a radical path to death, if one lives that long. It hasn't, then both lived, lived well, and it hasn't grown. That means, and if it actually contracts, which they say is magical thinking, the top surgeons have said that, I'll go. But what I don't want is to be diagnosed with the second CT scan and have doubts about the way I lived. That's the main thing. When I was living as a monk, we told ourselves to live well. Right now, I call it my time. I don't know about you, but this is my time to do all I possibly can, call in the sanctity of that five acre piece of land within 4,000 square feet here in Lower Kula, you know, just down the street with someone who keeps a big, beautiful mansion vacant because of their wealth somewhere in Oklahoma, <laughs> who knows that person, who wants to learn meditation digitally, freely. Namaste, right? Please manifest. And that would be a huge gift to have that kind of support. Um, and make good on the promise of my vision for myself. I don't know about you, but where do you feel that you want to make good on some promise you want to make to yourself more than you've already done? What's the next iteration, evolution, expression of your passion, your raison d'etre? So, things that are important to you, we've got time, topics, words. Pierre Paolo, please take your time. On the subject of freedom, uh, I found out with my recent episode in my heart that uh, I spent most of my life trying to be somebody. Mm. Be somebody parents, be somebody to my partner, be somebody to my community, be somebody to myself. And what I experienced when I was looking at the ceiling in the uh, ER, not knowing if it was going to come out or not, I felt like a wave of freedom coming from being nobody. And uh, since then, it's been a month ago, I've been living a very ordinary life, connecting with nature, being present to 
whatever arises in me in a way that uh, I never learned from any meditation teacher or spiritual teacher and I find that in my being nobody there is a lot of freedom mm -hmm. and I wanted to share that in and receive some feedback from you about that direction Okay, can I repeat what you just said for people? Please. This gentleman, an old ally friend of mine, <coughs> Pierre Paolo, uh, just recently back here on Maui from his home in Spain. If I can share, uh, I just learned today, and he's just expressing that a month ago he had a heart attack. And as a result of that, looking in the emergency room at the ceiling, he had deep reflection, paraphrasing what I heard him say about how he had been somewhat in an unrecognized posturing to be someone to other people, perhaps something other than himself to other people even, I'm not sure. His parents, his work, his partner. And at that time, a reflection came, and post that time, now a month, he's felt and seen the beauty, the power of being nobody and communing with nature and animals, trees, and primarily what I gather uh, himself. And he's asking, do I have thoughts about that? Uh, and I would like to respond to that comment by this gentleman. Um, you know, the general way that I respond is by simply sharing how I feel when I'm listening rather than an answer that might be of value. So with that said, just please let you in on how I'm thinking as I'm listening to both you and to me. And I'm wondering, um, one, I'm in gratitude for you as a man in my life over the years and the gift of our relationship that comes to mind. I want you to know that and share that with you. The courage to face a condition like that, uh, I know in my own case, it's radical. It's, there's nothing that can prepare you for it, but there you are. And so number one that came to mind was, look at the resources that you have found that are innate in you to give life to the wisdom of your choices over many decades. You know, it didn't take so-called a heart attack to be the man you are. It took your whole life. The heart attack was just sort of a, an exclamation mark after a paragraph. <laughs> Maybe a chapter hide, you know. Maybe a book title, who knows. <laughs> Big event, because it represents mortality, paralysis, the interruption, discontinuity. We have a terrible fear of discontinuity. And so where I've gone in my own process is I am who I am based on a result of many decades of ardent, deep psychological, spiritual, physical work. And so I would only encourage you as brother to know that your life is an expression of your, your wisdom, not your neglect. And then that you had that insight so quickly, you know, looking at the roof, it's like didn't wait. You know, I'd want to know from you in time, you know, whether we were hanging out, having a cup of wine or a glass of wine or just taking a walk. It's like, how did you see in your mind's eye, in your heart at that time, the ways in which you postured? You know, what did you see? I'd want to know. What did you see? That kind of thing, you know. And that's a lengthy conversation. Maybe we'll have it on a walk sometime soon. What did you see? Why did you do it? What did you learn? What were you unaware of that allowed you to continue to propagate a subtle inauthenticity? You know, and then what was the experience beyond the word heart attack that ignited that type of deeper existential human reflection? to see that your new insight was nobody in relationship to the perception of somebody. 
What does nobody mean came to mind? What does this gentleman mean by nobody? So that's, those are some of the things that came as reflecting back to you that if I were hanging out with you post here, I'd want to know more of, out of curiosity, to evolve our intimacy, our connection about your process. And um, then the last part, as a beginning of an entry into an unlimited part, there's no end to this discussion, uh, is now that you know what you know and what you didn't know when you didn't know it, what do you now want to do with what you know as you move forward into a more dimensional knowing? Like what do you want to do now that you know something more pure about yourself that gives you the reason to see what's happened not as a catalyst alone, but as an existential incentive to fulfill the greater promise of your existence now that you've seen how easily it could be cut. Now with the preciousness so apparent, what will you do with this month, this year, that really makes good on the promise that should you look at the roof again in the ER, if we're so lucky, I was there too, yeah? If we're so lucky, your reflection is, take me. Whatever it is, I have lived in the authenticity of my purity, my dignity. I am ready, my Lord. Take me where you need to take me. I cannot be killed by this heart attack. You know, so those are things that go on in my mind. That's something I would share with you. So, namaste, bro. Um, take your time. Oh, the questions, yeah. The, the, the psychological, you know, like, like finding all the, all the shadows. And, but then, you know, some of us have gone through those processes and, and of course there's, there's a lifting, but, but how to really unravel it, you know, uh, uh, to, where, to where there's a realization, like, me are you I, I see so you're you're pointing to am I correct tell me if I'm not correct you're pointing how to create within this process the epiphany yes. okay that's the epiphany um, that's a very oh, it's just so beautiful to even dive into feel into what it means to be so intimate, awake in ourselves and with others, where there is the ignition of the extraordinary, where it goes beyond awe into deep revelation, you know, revelation, right? Um, that's a very beautiful area for me to play in experimental, intersubjective spaces with others. It takes a very specialized environment you know, it's not as easy as pointing out to someone like the Advaitas do, you're not that, and walk you back into the invisibility of nobody other than that. That type of epiphany isn't really a transformational epiphany. It's more of a theatrical epiphany. The transformational wisdom of something where you, there's a revelation is a kind of opposite of a trauma, which is the rupture of continuity and familiar safety, into the, the Red Sea parting of a, a revelation that reveals to you, I am not who I have been. I am not who I am. I am this, right? Well, that, I mean, those are very, very rare. I'm more in the gradual school of the radicalization of a behavioral approach to consciousness, like intensive meditation. And all of a sudden, slowly you build the momentum of developing a more familiar connection to the qualities of consciousness that give rise to epiphany. 
the parallel word of the synonym of the epiphany in Buddhist psychology is called jnana. And then the more heightened epiphany of jnana is panya. And occasionally it comes slowly. All of a sudden you've walked yourself into, maybe you know from your own practice, your own presence, maybe right now. Heightened awareness, right? You know, the kind that only comes after three months of solidly connecting to it moment to moment. Heightened concentration where you can hear and see and feel thoughts and feelings and thoughts that just aren't easily recognizable. Present time awareness that's so here. And in that process, okay, what would, what would qualify for an epiphany? What do you want to know that you don't know, that you think that you would want to know called an epiphany? That would be a question. <laughs> So you begin to give some life to the evolution of it rather than relying upon the revelation. You know, let's take the psychedelic out of it. Let's take out the haste. And what is it that you want to know that you don't know? That's what I would ask you as Dhamma friend. What do you feel inside of your heart that you want to know that you don't know? Give me a hint. Give yourself a hint. Maybe I don't have to answer it particularly. But maybe that's a good thing to ask yourself. What do I want to know that I don't know? Could I be more free? Could I be more awakened? Could I be freer of fear? Am I living the life that I really want to be living? Probably. What is it that defines my life based on the deepest meaning of the raison d'etre of existence? What is my core passion that must be fulfilled in existence and in this life as much as possible. For me, I know exactly what that is. I can define that. It's not a belief. It's the bonification of space, time, consciousness, and context. But I will not stop. I feel this very determined in me. I will not stop until the epiphany of full enlightenment is my reality. I've taken me decades to get to that truth. I don't want to pretend that there's something else to do than to overcome once and for all, permanently, permanently, that's radical speech, permanently fear, greed, and delusion. I don't want to participate in the world of suffering anymore. I don't like this context. I don't want to keep having epiphanies. I don't want to keep living and being born and being married and eating fish and animals and denying death. I want to be free ultimately free of birth. Birth to me, strikes me, is suffering. I don't want to be in a world where there's rape and genocide. So it's very clear to me that the only way to do that is to translate this existence so that these conditions aren't reborn into this context. The epiphany of seeing this as hallucinatory. This to me is a bad dream. So what is your epiphany that you want? I just laid out mine. So it seems like the bad dream is a collective dream. It seems like, 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 you know, by transforming ourselves, we might, you know, that that we can't transform ourselves without transforming the collective and vice versa. Okay, well that's, I hear that as your ally, as a belief system. And if that's true, then you want more wisdom probably in how to do that effectively. Each of us can have different aspirations and therefore, you know, conduct in a way our own desired epiphanies. Muslims have epiphanies, Hindus have epiphanies, atheists have epiphanies, children have epiphanies, the awe and the wonderment of existence. You know, I've done my psychedelics, I've looked at the stars, you know, ah, 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 but they're still going extinct. You can't breathe out there. You can't see out there. It's all projection. You know, when I look at life, what you just described, I see an ocean of tears and blood and suffering. Yeah, that's what I'm reflecting. You know, I, but I feel like, okay, so there's consciousness, meeting consciousness, and moving into consciousness. Well, the Aristotle and analogy of looking at the back of the cave and mistaking the shadows for reality, It's like, I want to turn around and see reality. So the question becomes, if epiphany and reality were synonymous, degrees of reality that become epiphanictic, 
What kind of reality do you want to see? In yourself, to stay right at home in your mind and body. What's the ultimate freedom that you want? Material world, the, 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 it's, it's an illusion. It's, it's, it's a theater. Can I share a story with you? You know, this is very radical, but, you know, I'm very traditionally Buddhist despite not liking Buddhism. And the Buddha, who I deeply admire as a character, a figure, had exactly the desire of wanting to achieve a vision. Epiphanies are just shaping that vision into reality. They're giving you the motivation to like make haste, lady. Make haste, man. This, you, you just got a deep insight into the revelation of something that you know is driving you, right? And the Buddha was said to have made that vow with Sumedha, a Buddha way back. I want to have the mind of a Buddha be realized within my world. I want to know the secret things. I want to develop all the ten qualities of Buddhahood out of compassion, to be the optimal vehicle to transform existence and to do all that I possibly can to free it from suffering and then attain the parinibbana, trans-Buddhistic, you know, that thing. Okay, that's a very high aspiration. So he dedicated, it said in the text, dedicated his life to the development of ten qualities. Those ten qualities were the raison d'etre all throughout infinite existences until the final birth, 2,600 years ago, it said, when he took the final birth and became a Buddha. But it's the culmination of eons of other lifetimes from having made the vow to become a Buddha, known to become a Bodhisattva. That period of time with the development of ten qualities. One quality was dana or generosity. So in a lifetime, his epiphanies were, what could I do in this lifetime to develop the highest quality of one of those paramis. Meanwhile, the deeper vision was to become a Buddha. Often forgot, it said, the vision of becoming a Buddha or being a bodhisattva. But the instinct for freedom, the instinct for the paramis always came to him. And he was once a king, it said, in one of the stories. He had an epiphany. Ah, my reason to be is to develop generosity. Okay, this is my paraphrasing. He told his friend Ananda, who was his principal friend at the time, I want to give my eyes to that mendicant out there who's walking without eyes. Sir, why do you want to do that? You're the king of the kingdom. You need your eyes to help support the people. I want to make good, Ananda, on my promise of cultivating dana in this lifetime to the highest possible radiance. Allow me, my friend, to give my eyes to this man to develop parami of dana. Venerable sir, you're the king. How about you give one eye, keep one eye, give him one eye, both can see. No, my friend, it is a higher generosity to give him both eyes. He can see better than with one. And I want to fulfill my vow of becoming a Buddha. You know, it, 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 imagine the epiphany of wanting to give your eyes to me. I'd say, hey, 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 a heart transplant, a liver transplant, a kidney transplant, a lung transplant. You're, that's, those, that's epiphany. To motivate an action based upon a quality. That's all. It's a motivation to actualize. And so I ask you as ally, what is it that you want to actualize? Well, I just think all I feel is, is humbleness. Humbleness. I feel what you just, yeah, I just feel like um, cultivating any, any, any quote-unquote quality is, is almost like, like the, it's just Mm. It's, hum- it's humbleness. It's, it's, it's the destruction of the... Okay, cool, cool, cool. 
Shall we continue this conversation? Okay. So now, in this story, and I'm coming back to you in a second. You know, the, this this man who was a Buddha in a previous life, he was a he in his previous life, he was this king. Eventually, became the Buddha. He actually gave the eyes to the monk. And at the end of the story, as he told the story to monks and nuns back in India, 2,600 years ago, in the Jataka tale, he said, "And this was just the medium level of developing generosity." He looked up at the scars, stars and he said, I gave my eyes more often than there are stars in the sky to cultivate the quality of dana at that level of unconditioned. Think of that. Humbleness is the absence of self-preservation or the elevation of self either equal to other, hierarchical than other, or lower than other. Self-referencing. The absence of self-referencing seems to emanate humility, if it's authentic, right? Fair enough. So really what I'm hearing, and you can see for yourself what's true for you, is the I want to cultivate, evolve the quality of selflessness. What does that mean in my life? To make that vocation the primary raison d'etre of my being. And then you're, you're, you're in the epiphany wave, so to speak. You're riding it ashore because it's motivating the actions to give away belongings, to give away time, to give opportunity, selflessness, humility, and action. I always try to remember that consciousness is both embodied and in action. To me, stillness is compelling but nothing is more virtuous than the action of stillness. Share your inner wealth because we're inseparably interrelated. This gentleman survived because of another person. And biology and karma, who knows what those forces are. But that emergency room was staffed. Okay? And may your epiphany lead you to right actions, to fulfill the vocation of your heart, your soul, your reason to be, your dharma purpose. Humility in action, selflessness in action, doing meditations and visualizations and enacting behaviors as frequently as we feel motivated, right? To cultivate generosity. Every time that we give something, we have to relax attachment to self Regardless, even if it's like to reward ourselves, oh, I gave him such and such and, you know, look at me and still it's generosity. Given your time, the style in which we offer our services, our mind, our resources, our hope. And more radical expressions, I would encourage all of us, if it's interesting, to write them down. Uh, I've often joked and satirically presented that I think people in positions of power and leaders and politicians should open their lives and go to places where there are displaced people, areas of extreme conflict, refugee camps, and how interesting it would have been for the former president, Donald Trump, to actually have gone to a place like Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria and taken off of his his uniform, his coat, and let his hair down. And Milani went with him, and they just went there, and even for one brief two-week period of time, walked his walk. I care about the world. I want to make the world great. Here's how we do it. I want to learn to give, not just profit. You know, little things like that really make a big difference in the world if we actually couple action rather than being preoccupied too much, no offense, with the epiphany. It's the, that the shadow of quick, often I find in our lives, enlightenment. The non-dual schools have often gone into the aha moment. I, I really see that it's been a, a denigration of the, the evolutional process of consciousness, personally. It's, it's not even bypassing, it's just downright uh, blatant uh, 
denialism of the process of consciousness, the evolution of qualities and principles, and the beauty of seeing things like uh, simple generosity, simple loving kindness, simple compassion. Another thing that comes to mind too, you know, you, you were here yesterday, correct? You know, uh, because it's such a difficult quality for me, empathy, I am more inclined towards seeing the shortcomings in something. I have a higher degree of, I'm as trained as an athlete, and you always are looking for ways to be better, which often looks at ways that you don't do it well enough. And you're in this very hierarchical, kind of elegant competition with the people who are better than you. And you learn very good and quickly that if you're talented, you elevate and you respect higher talent. But you're always looking for ways to improve by looking at shortcomings in your own behavior. With empathy, I notice my shortcomings with my inability to manifest that on a very frequent basis. But I would like to cultivate it. My inclination is isolation, self-preservation, artistry, the aesthetics of my own style, intimacy with one. But it's, you know... So my way of saying that if you talk about selflessness and humility, I would think that the proactive expression of that is empathy. You know, you're really willing to bring yourself into another person's life. Not just be humble in their present and modest. And so maybe the word empathy could be evolved and study the ways to nurture the arising of inspiration, passion, epiphany, to illuminate the emotionality of empathy in action. You know, once a week you go to some place where you can serve without needing to be remunerated or being acknowledged. A soup kitchen, walking down the streets of anywhere in the world and being willing to casually offer something, volunteering somewhere in places where there's extreme complexity, like what Tess was mentioning yesterday about the people who were on the streets and struggling with addiction. You know, keeping that epiphany, it's such an epiphany that I'm actually making a vocation out of it. I don't need to be inspired to do it. I'm doing it. So part of the impulse for epiphany, as compelling as it is, I hear it as I was talking to Pierre Apollo, in all honesty, I'll stop here. I hear it as a desire to light a fire in your heart. I'm not quite who I am living the way that I want to be, but I say that with total respect that it could be me and had nothing to do with you. But something to try on for size, and to see if there is fires build slowly with a little bit of wood, a little bit of protection. Next thing you know, I'm in the fire of my life. I am an expression of the radiance of my humility. I am who I am and the humble edge of my own ability. What do you do? What's your preoccupation? What's your vocation? Alan, it's been a year since we've seen each other and I would say that my vision is to be a being of empathy. What does that look like? How has it been? I write children's books. I stop thinking about poetry and I'm beginning to write my own. And I've dedicated to give everything I have in my life away. Slowly. <laughs> I mean, that's a very beautiful thing to think about, that I'm everything in my life is to be given away. Isn't that really what God is teaching us? Isn't that what we're here to do, is to give everything away? That really is an affront to our Western sanity. <laughs> so when I hear what you're saying, my way of saying you're a beautiful woman, a beautiful mind, and that you have that aspiration it is a miracle in this rare world of human life with high qualities. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you for being in my life. Thank you for your good life, your good friendship, your commitment to the Dharma, 
and uh, your commitment to humility. It's a gift, you know, it's a gift. The last thing, what if your embodiment is so, so realized that your life is an expression of cosmological epiphany? Every cell in your body that you're alive, breathing at this stage of life, every clothing that you wear, every word that you say, it's a bonfire of epiphany. (laughs) You know, unmediated self-realization that I am who I am. I no longer am seeking. You know, the classic Advaita line, call off the search, right? Embody the radiance of the highest realization that you're willing to dare to feel. I am enlightened, right? Only to fall back down into the cliff of darkness and denial. Humility is a long-ass process, I can see, because I don't have much of it. (laughs) And empathy, I'm really short-changed in that area. So humility to self, you know, never give up on self-deprecation as an expression of humility. Exposing our weaknesses as strengths. Not being afraid of the ways in which we don't live in the ideal of our Dharma life. Overcoming hypocrisy by revealing the ways in which we neglect to include self-honesty. If only gurus and teachers would do that. Hey, I'm human. Radically imperfect. I'm having right now an open affair with my partner's wife. I am deceiving you. I am not a non-profit guru. I'm a lover of money. I want to be honored for the truth in me, not the projection that I want you to believe. Mm. Are you talking about hypocrisy and self-deception, sir? Yes, we all have it. It doesn't fly in the West to do that. We want to project perfect. We want to be out of ourselves with awe. So a little bit of the internalization of awe is the shadow of that type of projection externally. It could be masked by the need to have an epiphany. It could be the residual of a non-respect for the intimacy of a slow evolutional development of your being over time. Taking the speed out of things is to really, really situate in a type of, not timelessness, but for me, but the radiance of I'm in process. I want to take my time like good wine. I'm in no hurry, no hurry to be uncorked, you know, so like with a lover, sit back. I don't want you to die, lover, but I know we're both going to die. Take the time out of presence and feel and then couple actions with that so that your gift is shared with people. That to me is the greatest thing right now. We're all very close to my mother's body in a wheelchair, unable to go to the call of nature or bathe. Imagine right now in this room, we all aged just enough to be unable to care for ourselves. We were brought to this room and dropped off where we sit, and we can't move until that person comes here and helps us go back to our home. What a different space that would be, right? Now, talking about Kema with the Buddha, where he created a psychic image of her aging in one minute over 60 years. Imagine if we had the epiphany right now to unveil from consciousness how we restrict clarity of reality through narrations of time. Imagine right now if this was psychedelicized and nibonified And we saw that you and me, whatever age we are, in one minute right now, I'm going to turn on this. Are you ready? This has been the the grand finale of our lives. One minute, we're all going to see our destiny over the next 20 years. Could we handle that? Imagine going into an existential artificial intelligence lab 
where that is being created along with a high dose of wisdom, not psilocybin, wisdom, (laughs) that actually artificial intelligence has placebos now where consciousness is illuminated to do what the Buddha did through psychic powers but through artificial intelligence. And all of a sudden, one minute is 20 years, 20 years is one minute. What would that do if this gentleman or me or you saw that you did have a heart attack three months from now and it just happened in that give me back that time. Take that fastness out of time. Take reality out of reality, right? We would freak. Are we prepared for that level of truth? So when we talk about epiphany, it's like how radical could we get with imagination to create enlightened scenarios of full awakening. That's what's so rad about the Buddha's teaching as I read it today. They're constantly in reference to the creation of psychic phenomena like artificial intelligence. We are one second away from holograms that can create wisdom dynamics that radically, I think, challenge ordinary human consciousness to awaken to deeper realities. We could uncork enlightenment through artificial intelligence. It's possible to so influence the placebo. Have you not seen the movie? You have to see it. It's free online. It's David Suzuki narrates it. And it's done by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in Canada. Uh, And it's the power of placebo. The power of placebo, and it's utterly fascinating to see him and to see this hour-long film. And you you have one fellow here who's a blind subject who wants to see and study the role of alcohol on brain functioning. So you see him in the movie being narrated by David Suzuki, a tremendous authority of truth and wisdom. And the lab technicians given him a shot of pure vodka. And he's he's a drinker, so he's cool and he's down with this and throws it in. Love it. Love it. Waits about 10, they're chatting. Of course, it's cut to about 20 seconds. Gives him a second shot. <laughs> this, is, this is good. What kind of vodka is this? Tells them a lie. Really killer vodka. And he's up to nine shots now. <laughs> I can't mimic him. <laughs> God damn, man. This is killer fucking vodka. Okay, the truth is that it's faux vodka. It has nothing to do with vodka. It just tastes like vodka. Placebo. Non alcohol. Wow. Same with unthinkably challenging catastrophic illnesses. Special medicine has been given in this special test that will allow you to walk. Do you want to be part of that? On camera. They get up out of wheelchairs. They've been confined for a year, two, five, ten. I don't know whether it's true or not, but when you look back at where placebo came from, I think it was in World War II, correct me on Wikipedia, that Allied soldiers, medics at the front lines, were in the absence of morphine and tremendously graphic wounds, legs, arms. And so they said, listen, let's just put saline solution in there and tell them it's morphine. And there was no pain. And I think that's, I could be wrong, but I think that's where the birth of modern day placebo came from. I have often joked way back in the day when I was able to be on stages that in the Buddhist tradition alone, you have the leaders of these different traditions, whether it be Tibetan or Zen or Chan or... Would you please close that door? No problem. Uh, Theravadan, all the four sects of the Tibetan tradition, they all espouse enlightenment and they all worship a Buddha. Mm -hmm. The Buddha. There wasn't two Buddhas, there was one. But every tradition has a different enlightenment. And I've often joked, I don't know whether it's true or not, that you can take a Tibetan from the Galupa tradition bring him to Burma in the Theravada tradition and he'd have a Tibetan enlightenment. 
that would be seen as wrong view in the Theravada tradition because of the cultural interior setting. Now, if that's true, I wonder what we could do playing with concepts and emotionality, context, space and physics, and possibly even something to do with the molecules to create states of consciousness that normally require long-term renunciation, doning the loan cloth, going into a cave, long-term ass-sitting, meditation, renunciation. Go to the Ganges and Banaras or Varanasi and see the ancient traditions of the mendicants. Is it possible to speed up evolution, to bypass thousands and millions of I think we're at that place, right? Call us dreamers, but I think that's where evolution really becomes evolutionary and radically revolutionary. I think that's, to me, a very exciting new field of where the intersection of artificial intelligence with cognitive organic intelligence. And the this is where I see the role of the the, halluc- the anti-hallucinatory molecule, not the hallucinatory molecule, and the unthinkable intersubjective sensitivity of consciousness with consciousness among those technicians and savants and artists who know the field of consciousness and create conditions, not of placebo, but conscious placebo. I am giving you something that is actually a placebo, and it's said to work in a lot of the cases now. It's not a blind study, right? Straight up. So my sense is, wow, we're at the threshold of who among us on this planet, who might be born? Just like those boys and girls right now in those rad places in Berlin or in Sydney or Melbourne and Ottawa that are in their underground basement hiding from their parents these radical experimentations in music, in artificial intelligence. No, I'm not doing any drugs today, Mom. And they're playing things that transform consciousness. It could very well be that they're the next gurus. And the recipients are our children. And all of a sudden, greed, anger, and delusion. How in the hell did you go into that booth and pay a dollar and come out totally transformed. <laughs> I thought you had to go to a monastery in Tibet or Nepal in Dharamsala. You haven't read the Dalai Lama's book. Mom, you can't do that to me. <laughs> I mean, are we prepared for that level of radicalization of behavior? Give me back my delusion, you know, that kind of thing. Give me back my ordinary. Anyway, carry away. You ever known the story of how antidepressants were sold to Japan? Let me close with this. Not close, but coming close to the end. You know, because there's a lot of talk right now about global totalitarianism, the vaccination, vaccination passports, the selling of big pharma. These guys are creeps, right? And they want us to think of them as salvation. It's like, who the fuck do you think we are, man? It's like the selling of cigarettes to the world with, was it... Um, Freud's nephew in 1923 or something hired top models at the end of a march for freedom of women's rights. And they all lit up cigarettes in the New York Times did a big photograph. They called cigarettes by these 10 models that were smoking the torches of freedom. And women began to associate that smoking and freedom were inseparable and therein lies were cancer and emphysema and death happened through the cigarette, the absolute manipulation of consciousness through big tobacco. And we're supposed to believe that big pharma is on our side? (laughs) Hello, you're wrong. And, you know, this was years ago, but when Paxil sort of dated, you know, as uh, Prozac is dated, but nonetheless... Japan was a great market. I'm not sure who the maker of Paxil was. It may have been Pfizer. I'm not sure. But they saw Japan as an active market. And so this is all well documented. And so they introduced the antidepressant 
Paxil to the leading authorities in the country, which were primarily physicians. And there were very few psychiatrists in Japan at that time because the collective psyche and the individual psyche, as I understood it in Japan, didn't necessarily see sadness as a cause of something wrong with you. In Buddhism, it's natural to feel that life is unsatisfactory. And so sadness was sort of integrated over generations as acceptable. And so they tried to introduce this antidepressant that made people better who were depressed, but there was no concept of depression in Japan at that time, apparently. And so the doctors failed in their ability to prescribe this, and whoever the makers of Pfizer or Paxil were failed in their ability to migrate this drug that had become a billion dollar or more seller in the West to Japan anyway. So they got hip to how to market the drug to the doctors through discussions where they tied in the word sadness of the soul in Japanese to the word chi, energy. And they coupled it with the word flu. You have the flu of the soul. And they associated it with the propaganda that the feeling of sadness was somehow wrong for you. Okay. Make a long story short. Suicide is through the roof in Japan. Thank you, Big Pharma, for selling and, and manufacturing and making a poison and manipulating human consciousness to make money so you can play golf and go hunting. And cigarettes. Can you imagine right now if Big Tobacco were the makers of the vaccine and they would like us to believe that they've got a remedy through smoking that will make you happy and healthy. That emphysema is actually good for you. Oh, that cancer is actually good for you. There's something in the cigarette that's healthy for you. Look at the ads that you still see in Rolling Stone magazine for cigarettes. Good looking, empowered joy. It's just absolute satanic sickness. And we live in a world in which that kind of corruption of consciousness, and I don't know why I'm bringing this up, but coming back here on the 4th of July is to safeguard ourselves from misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, and being sculpted and conscripted into the army of totalitarianism. And whether the vax, COVID's real, so are a lot of other things in our bodies and life. The vaccine is clearly a very, very mixed bag. We all know that at this point. We've seen the vice president who for 33 years was at Pfizer. We've seen his test. We've seen it. We know that there's lots of good scientists and doctors on both sides of the story. It's our choice to do what we want, but the, 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 the totalitarian tsunami of control is like, no, 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 no. And all of a sudden from lockdown to passports, next thing you know, we're locked into this cult of belonging as slave to this totalitarian madness. And here we are, we're not going to be conscripted as brown shirts into the Fourth Reich. Is that conspiratorial? Is that David Icke speaking through me? <laughs> Am I like a, you know, a running dog for Donald Trump and QAnon? No. I'm an independent thinker. It's not conspiratorial to stand up for freedom. Right. And I think that's a very important thing for us to do here on 4th of July as Americans, some of us, and world citizens, to not just live freely, but to make sure that we're not co-opted by coercive structures that subjugate. Spiritual, biblical, economic, psychological, the normalization of slavery, the normalization 
of the cult of mass murder of animals, the normalization of the desecration of nature. We belong to, we're genocidal creatures for God's sake. I'm not even going to ask questions about who we are and what we do and how we live, what we wear and how we eat. But we're all perpetuators of a strange conundrum called life on a planet in this dimension of existence, in this dimension of causality, where damn if you do and damn if you don't. I know in Sri Lanka on the island hermitage, if I didn't keep moving, I would be in the food chain. I remember seeing one of these big cubras, these dragons, an older dragon who I knew now for about six or seven months became somewhat ill. He was a big guy. And you get used to animals when you're not talking and hanging. You know that. What happened? Some of the younger bucks circled him and just hung out. It was terrifying to me to see this. And the, the older guy could no longer walk. But he could wag his tail, swoop, throw his head you know, like a crocodile would. But slowly they'd inch in the other cobras and try to nip at him. And you can see little bites on his body. It was, it was, this is samsara, right? A hell world. This is like looking into the... I dare even use this word. Imagine right now if we had a minute of life for those in Auschwitz. Stunning, right? That we live and coexist in this dimension. Yeah. The normalization of desecration. How in the hell were so many good people conscripted into that mass murder? <sighs> North Korea, Korea, all of it. <sighs> I want out. Okay, end of story. What happened to that big male dragon? Army ants. It was unthinkable to see like this wide army ants coming out of that big eight foot hill marching right down. What did they do? Can you bear this? They went into the guy's mouth, ate it from the inside out. And after two days, there was nothing but white bones. I went, fuck. If I fall down and break my ankle here, I am nothing but a skeleton. I'm going like, and I'm calling this a good place to exist. This is not a safe zone. And I know this is a terribly challenging self-truth. I won't say it should be. I want out. I've been saying it for years. I wrote this book. This book, for those of you who read it, it's based upon one question that was never intended to be a book. I went to this gentleman's house that was gifted to me with one question on my mind after three years of deep, unremitting pain. Why stay alive? And I had in front of me my 500 micrograms of acid that I did, and I had my syringe of morphine. And I made a vow to myself at midnight, if I don't have a reason to live, I'm going to mindfully euthanize. And it was never meant to be a book. And I documented the evidence of that journey. And it took me about seven months of coming to the truth of what I was going to do. And I wasn't clear until about the final week. Then I decided, you know, it's powerful. And you don't know this, but one of my best friends, Robert Chardoff, best known as one of the best and most prolific film producers in Hollywood, who's most known for his Rocky movies. And of course, those of you who like or don't like, but the theme, the archetypal theme, of, as I understand it, is never give up. And he was my, he died. I married he and his wife in 1990. And he was my spirit guide throughout the process of the question. And I won't give away the ending, obviously, the ending's obvious. <laughs> However, I bring it up is I am so challenged. I wanted to, I'm so challenged with continuing the journey. 
Because I don't think of non-continuity as a human to be a problem. I have a deep, deep, we didn't get into it, a deep regard on a personal level for devas and deities and communion with non-humans and nature and animals. Very down with certain animals now. Frankly, I prefer them to humans. And especially hummingbirds, especially flowers, squirrels, and just communing and feeling. By way of saying, I'm terrified of living. I consider it a virtue. They call it in Buddhist psychology, sanvega, a radical urgency to make haste with the highest expression of your reason to be a human. And I have my reason. I want to be fully enlightened, the absence of fear and greed. I want to be in the company of a Buddha. I want to be with my samsaric sangha. I want to have the full range of psychic intuitive powers. And I want to, what's called, exit conditionality. They call it parinibbana. These aren't ideals, but it's taken me a long time in this life to speak them, to feel the radiance. This is where nibbanification has come in. I rarely have ever used a word, it's very virginal, but I want to attain the highest expression of Nibbana and to be in the company of those boys and girls and deities. And But I'll tell you, don't cry a tear if I die. Don't write a poem. Don't send donations. Don't have a memorial, an elegant, quiet passing, because I have lived well I am going to continue to live well. I know where I'm going. I've got a practice called the Aditant Aparami, a declaration of navigating here to there. I know where I want to take rebirthing birth. And I encourage you, should you want to open up your dimensionality, be thinking more of who you are in context to your highest vision Transphysical life, especially at our stage. This gentleman spoke about looking at the mirror of his own heart under the attack of biology and God. Had a deep realization. Don't place your worth and values in your body. Consciousness is a gem if we make it one. Otherwise, it could become the worst enemy to self and other. That's the diabolical existential battle found within the human heart. Good and evil, right and wrong, right? So may I encourage you to untether from the familiarity of the ordinary called the human embodiment of consciousness. Open up the spectrum. Our time, extinction here, both Nibbana and also of life, our time is immeasurably short. you want to save yourself a lot of scientific dot connecting, you can read this. Time is short. We're brothers and sisters on this journey. For us to be in this room together, we're family, sangha, rare who we are, who we've been, where we'll be. It may very well be in this life, I care for you when you can't care for yourself. I want to know that I can rise to that occasion and in the next life, may we be enlightened together. May we be brothers and sisters in a sangha that takes it higher and higher. So in closing, if I may, we've got like five or six minutes. May I invite you, should you wish, that we'll sit in a little bit of meditative connectivity and do a little bit of self-love and to close this three days as an opening, a way to share what we've shared here for the betterment of all beings everywhere. So may I invite you, please, take a comfortable seat for the next few minutes 
Either place your palms on your knees or cupped in your hand. Don't hesitate to take a breath or two or three to open, to chill, to occupy, to embrace. And let the breathing breathe on its own and just sit upright without being too tense. Close the eyes gently. Let the tongue rest in the mouth. May we acknowledge our own lives, all that we've done, all of who we are. A self-respect, embodied dignity. I am who I am. I embrace you. I respect you. I listen to you. I want to learn to love every part of you. Basic self-honor. Feeling our bodies, our minds, our histories, our memories, our hopes, our dreams, our fears. The archetypal mother lover embracing all of it all of us, all of it, and that too. Flaws, strengths, our humanness. As we sit together in this room on the side of an active volcano in the middle of the Pacific, seven miles deep on Mother Earth spinning 25,000 miles an hour around a sunball in a solar system, in a galaxy, in a universe, in a meta-universe. And here we sit together at this moment in time with no past or future that can be calibrated. Crystals of consciousness refracting conditions that give rise to memory, thoughts, feelings, identities, and the great unknown, like the vastness of this island beneath the surface of the subconscious, deep in the substratum of infinity. And here we sit, trying to figure it out trying to do our best, honoring that. May I invite you to invite all of us to share the virtues, the principles, the strengths, the qualities that we've developed together here. May we openly share them like pouring water from a vessel openly in all directions. Pour forth, radiate brightly, the virtue of unconditional giving. I am who I am because I can give away and support the well-being of others in all dimensions, the animals, the trees, the deities, the devas, far and near, known and unknown, may all beings be free of suffering and despair. May all beings follow their heart's truth and be happy. Discover timeless truths that liberate. And as we end this day as a beginning an ongoing flow. May I humbly invite, should you wish, your own most intimate 
few words to yourself, a prayer, a hymn, a hope, an encouragement. What do you want to say to yourself at this time? Please say it. Say it to yourself. Say it to the people close to you. Say it to the world. Say it to all beings everywhere in all dimensions. A sonic prayer of goodwill in this vast, mysterious samsara. To close the day, should you wish, let us chant, taking refuge in the qualities of awakening the Buddha, taking refuge in the lawfulness of transformation, the Dhamma, and taking refuge in our own Sangha, the overlapping Sangha of our lives, Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And allow me, please, to chant it once. And then, if you so wish to join in, we can do it a second and a third time together. Buddhang saranang gachami Dhamang saranang gachami Sangang saranang gachami and if you wish, we can do it together. Buddhang saranang gachami Dhammang saranang gachami Sangang saranang gachami And a third time. Buddhang saranang gachami Dhammang saranang gachami Sangam Saranam Gachami From my heart to yours, thank you for your time, your heart, your love, your kindness. If I've said anything that may have offended you or anyone online, please excuse me. And may we move into the future as brothers and sisters in this world doing all that we can to overcome violence and to elevate the status of freedom. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you folks for tuning in.